K. Trevor, welcome to Q. Thanks for having me back. Last time you were here, I wasn't here, and I have to tell you, I was a little bummed about it. I, I think I've been here through three different hosts. Oh, good. My my first time here, Candy was hosting, and yep. then I was here last time with Ali, mm-hmm. and uh, now now you. So. N- and next time, Brent Butt. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Brent Butt on the CBC. Yeah, there I, we say his you know, name. Once, once a year. <laughs> Every year, he, he slums it. Uh, your album is called Christmas with a K. Before we start talking about it, let's play a little bit of it. The first time it was ever recommended to me to say Happy Holidays instead of Merry Christmas, I was working retail. I was working at that video store that I robbed. (laughs) And it was before the Christmas season started, someone from corporate headquarters came down and was like, look, this Christmas season, we'd like the official greeting here to be Happy Holidays. Not all of our customers celebrate Christmas, so to be more inclusive, just say happy holidays. And someone, I remember someone in the meeting went, what if you know that they celebrate Christmas, can you say Merry Christmas then? And the people said, yes, of course you can. We're reasonable people and that makes a lot of sense. (laughs) But if you're unsure, just say happy holidays because it's more polite. And I've never, I've never understood how people can get upset at being polite to other people at Christmas time. How this concept of being nice and inclusive offends people at Christmas. If it is Christmas time and you are struggling with the idea of being kind to other people, you have missed the f***ing point. <laughs> That's some of K. Trevor Wilson's comedy from his new record. Can I just back up a little bit? <laughs> you robbed... You worked at the video store that you robbed? <laughs> I robbed it while I worked there. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean? It's it's covered actually in the album. It's another another whole bit in the album, but uh they uh I, I was uh, forced to work Christmas Day and uh my managers left me by myself uh while I was I had never closed the store ever and uh I was there missing my Christmas dinner and the managers all went home to have their Christmas dinner. And they were all supposed to be there with me the entire time. And they're just like, yeah, no, I'm just going to go anyways. And left me alone. And I'm like, I don't have keys or <laughs> the security code uh, or any of that. And they were like, it, it, we're, we're still leaving. So just figure it out. And uh, so after everyone left, I just was like, well, screw it. I'm just taking what I want and going. So <laughs> I worked the rest of the shift. And then at the end of the night, I just I locked the front door. Because that was the only key I had, and then I hung it back up where I was supposed to, mm-hmm. and then I just uh, filled my backpack with the stuff I wanted and mm-hmm. left. <laughs> you had a nice VHS tape of Encino Man. It's great, you know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the manager told me he got a call at like three in the morning that the security alarm was going off because mm-hmm. the back door had been left uh, open, and I was like, "Yeah, I told you." <laughs> I, I and he said, was like, "All right, fair enough. So this is just going to be between us then." <laughs> <laughs> Until now. Until now. Until now, it's out there. <laughs> Listen up, Glenn. Well, actually, the, the, that was the assistant manager, and then the, the actual head manager of the store got fired like two months after Christmas because she was stealing money from the till to pay her bar tab and um, uh, was smoking crack. So, Real, ups- <laughs> real upstanding establishment, this video store. A lot of, uh, yeah, real upstanding, law-abiding establishment. So it's like I was actually the least criminal there. <laughs> you robbed the place, and you were the, you were, you were the most law-abiding person there. I was there. the most law-abiding person there. What? All I did was take some videos. Where'd you, where'd you grow up? I'm a Toronto, born and raised. I grew up in Etobicoke. What's, what's Christmas like for you in Etobicoke? What was it like growing up? Uh, I'm, it was pretty, like, we, our cousins call us the Christmas house. Like when when they come home to visit, they they always wanted to come by our place because uh, mom and dad really did it up. Like we were very Rockwellian in our Christmas. It was something out of a Saturday Evening Post, just you know, garland and holly everywhere. My mom still like hand makes our wreath for us and really? drops it off at our place. Uh, and our Christmas, we actually just did our our family Christmas party this past uh, weekend. It's, my parents have been doing the same Christmas open house for forty five years, so long before even I existed and now my sister's taken over hosting it at her place but uh, we usually get like a couple hundred people through every year just mom bakes all the like no catering mom bakes everything and the sisters prepare everything and uh, I just write a check <laughs> <laughs> it's it, it seems like on this album from from what I heard of it it feels like this is a like 
this feels like a, a, almost a reminiscence of what you actually lived through as opposed to like a, a hot takey kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. it's pretty much just uh, my own stories right. through, through Christmas, my own experiences. You know, not everyone has the same Christmas, but everyone has Christmas, mm-hmm. you know, who does. And uh, uh, for anyone who's gone through it, it's, uh, they'll probably find a bunch of stuff that is similar to their own family. And to people who don't know anything about Christmas, they get to, to learn about at least what one family does every year and... And, uh, yeah, it's pretty much just been the progression of Christmases to now. It starts when I was a kid and works my way up through being a dirtbag teenager and, uh, you know, lands us as an adult. I feel like, I feel like one of the consistencies in your Christmas experience is, is this one. Here I am, the Christmas turkey. Uh, Ow! Hey, <laughs> watch it there, will you? Yeah. <laughs> 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 Oh, yeah, yeah, I recognize it now. This is the, this is the traditional fitting, right? To see if the roasting pan is big enough for the nice fat bird. Yo, 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 gobbler, gobbler, turkey, fitsky, whitsky. Okay, Trevor Wilson, what was that? What did we just hear? That is a clip from A Muppet Family Christmas, the uh, Christmas special I watch every year. You do Since love it, hey? I love it. I think it came out in 1986 or 87. And uh, for me and my family, like, that was our favorite. It was the one that brought together... The Muppets and Sesame Street and Fraggle Rock all into one tremendous Christmas special. They all crash Fozzie's mom's farmhouse, and she's on her way out to Tahiti and has to cancel her Christmas plans to host the entire uh, Muppet extended family. Do you still watch it? Yeah, I mean, we had we taped it off the TV one year and had that VHS. <laughs> I know that. I know. And the like lines a million started to, years. to show up. Yeah, and then. God bless, someone threw it up on YouTube a while back, and it's, bless you. Bless you, Andrew. And uh, someone sneezed. He We're not just really religious here. He hates, the, we just, in the middle of the interview, whenever we mention Fraggle Rock, we have to say bless you a few times. That's how God bless you. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so we, we um, I watch it every year, like my, my I already did. Uh, it's already, I've already had my seasonal viewing, and I'll probably... Watch it at least one or two more times before the day. So where did this idea of a Christmas album come from? Uh, it all started uh, last November when we were filming uh, Letter Kenny up in Sudbury. And uh, my fiance, who was just my, my girlfriend back at the time, uh, my fiance Marisa, she works on the show actually uh, as the dog walker. She walks the dogs for the producers and the directors when they're on set all day. So she comes up uh, every season with me to shoot and... Uh, we were driving around, uh, I think she'd pick me up from work or something, but we were driving around all month and, and blasting the Christmas channels on, on uh, satellite radio. And I, I sing along with all the carols. And she just sort of offhanded commented, you know, you like Christmas carols so much, you should put out your own Christmas album. And uh, we laughed and I was like, yeah, but you know, we could do that. Like if we really wanted to, like we have a we're, we're part of a record label. We can just do it. So we joked about it a bit more. And then I messaged up my, my manager, Barry, over at Comedy Records and said, I want to do a Christmas record. And he said, perfect. Okay, we'll, we'll do it. <laughs> and you recorded it. And, and what people don't know about making a Christmas album, whether it's a Christmas like music album or Christmas comedy album, you don't make it in December. Like You make it in in the summertime. You made this thing in July, right? We uh, June and July, we did the, the body of the work. I think it was actually... Like, we were working on it since last Christmas, like, putting it all together, and I was figuring out what the stories were going to be, and uh, I, I did a reunion with my old sketch troupe back in March for the Toronto Sketch Comedy Festival, and, and I was chatting with the guys then that I wanted them to come on and, and do some sketch on the record, and then... But it's hard to do a Christmas, getting the Christmas spirit in the heat of a t- t- Toronto summer, isn't it? It was really weird. Like, I, you know, I'm not going to lie, like, we were all in cargo shorts in the in the studio recording well i was in cargo shorts other people <laughs> have better fashion taste but uh yeah it was about may i, I started working with chris sugiuchi who's the musical director on the on the project and uh, he's a he's an old family friend and he actually uh every year does a the big gay christmas cabaret mm-hmm. and so he was, he was the perfect guy to go to for christmas songs he was right in his wheelhouse and uh chris and i started working on it in may g- going over to his place and He's he's like one of those geniuses with a keyboard. Like I would just start telling him what I was thinking about the arrangements, and he's like, "Oh, like this," and then just hammers it out right. in one take. And it's like, "Yeah, that's exactly how I want it to go." 
And then, yeah, it was June we got into the studio to record it. And then July, I flew out to Winnipeg for a week of shows at Rumors, and we recorded all the stand-up. And, uh, you we, had to get a crowd in there, by the way, too. We, we had... To we feel did Christmassy. Like two disclaimers before I started my set that I'm going to be talking about Christmas stuff for at least the first half of the show. So it's going to seem weird, but trust me, it'll make sense when the record comes out. And, and they got into it? They were okay? Winnipeg, you know what? They, they're they used to winter when it's not supposed to be winter. Right. <laughs> <laughs> They've earned the name Winterpeg for a reason, you know? Like, I was in Winnipeg for the first day above zero, and it was April. Yeah. Like, <laughs> so I was like, Winnipeg was right on board, and and uh, I've actually I, I've recorded my last two albums in in Winnipeg at, at Rumors, uh, uh, sorry Canadian record, and now uh, Christmas with a K, and the audiences are terrific. Uh, Winnipeg is is ready to laugh at anything, and I, I love Winnipeg because they don't take themselves too seriously. Like they're a weird city, and they know that. Deanne's from Winnipeg. I was looking at her this whole time. Not even from Winnipeg, from outside of Winnipeg, which is even weirder. Oh, we're uh, Gladstone? From uh, St. Anne, <laughs> from the Franco-Manitoban region oh, of Manitoba. Wow. I know. Even, <laughs> even weirder, Nian. Uh, you, you mentioned that it's not just an album of stand-up. It's an album of some songs and some, some sketch comedy. Um, there's your version of uh, Baby, It's Cold Outside. Take a listen to this. Say, what's in this drink? Oh, uh, well, it's a store-bought eggnog mix I and a little bit of white how. rum. What you might be tasting is nutmeg. A little spell. nutmeg. I'll take your hat. Your hair looks swell. I ought to say no, 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 sir. Okay, well, if you choose to that say that, I will respect that. that. What do you mean tried? I, I, I really whoa. can't stay. That is a loaded sentence. You just said, it's cold. That is Kate Trevor Wilson's version of Baby a Cold Outside. You know, there's a, there's a reference there to the controversy around the song that it implies the sexual coercion. Uh, have you heard John Legend's version of this yet? I, I have. I actually, just the other day for the first time, uh, my fiance Maurice and I were driving and it came on the radio. And uh, I think it's with Kelly Clarkson. Yeah, we have a clip. Can we take a listen? I simply should go. Text me when you get home. Oh. Mm, I guess that's respectable. This welcome has been. I feel lucky that you so dropped in. But you better go. John Legend there with Kelly Clarkson calling it the consensual version of Baby It's Cold Outside. So sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt oh, you. Oh, no worries. You were driving around with your with your. They fiance. were really making a meal out of that one. <laughs> I, I love about the John Legend version is uh, when she says that her brother will be pacing the floor, he comments that the brother's probably a fan of his music. Yeah. I think that's my... <laughs> He's probably a fan of... I was like, that's my favorite part of the whole song. He's trying to, geez, just toot your own horn, John Legend. Come on. He's probably excited that you're hanging out with me because he's such a big fan of my work with The Roots. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know. I think everyone's going to be putting out new versions of this. I mean, I got the idea last year when all the controversy was happening, like... Mm -hmm. Well, let's just do a version, and, and what would happen if the song ended it? No, and uh, it's so unsatisfying yeah. you, <laughs> to not finish a, a musical number. Like, mm -hmm. oh, there's a little bit of OCD that starts kicking in every time I hear it. Like, <laughs> I, I should just go back and finish the rest of the song. But, <laughs> uh, we just had fun doing it. Like, I, I'm a fan of music theater, and, uh, you know, when, when all that nonsense started kicking up last year, I was just, I, are, are you kidding me? Like, of all the silly things to like, you know, all you have to do is, is one tertiary glance at the history of the song to know it was written by a married couple. Like, right. it's safe to say it was a consensual work. They were married, you know? Right, 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 <laughs> right, 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 right. And to like, to, to go and like, well, this song could be like, okay, so the lyrics don't age well. Like, really? Yeah. You know, uh, not not the only thing you're not a fan of. You're not a fan of the Twelve Days of Christmas either. I saw that. Oh, well, that just that song. It, it, it you never actually finished that song. Like that song is <laughs> someone is still singing it right now. <laughs> <laughs> it was the longest Christmas song. Uh, you know, I, I I started working on a version for the album, and I just you, you need a theme. You need a particular theme to go into, and you know, like the. As I said, uh, actually, on the album, I say the best version, in my opinion, is Bob and Doug McKenzie, uh, as far as if you're going to do a Canadian version of the 12 Days of Christmas. 
and uh, and but they don't finish the whole song. <laughs> yeah, they do, and a beer, right? Yeah, yeah. but yeah. I mean, they they get part way through and then just sort of drift off. Like the backup <laughs> singers are finishing the song, and they're just arguing <laughs> up until the end. And no one, no one ever really finishes that song, and <laughs> you don't want to. It's and then I looked into the history of that song. It's ridiculous. No one needs that many birds. No, certainly not. The first, like the first eight gifts, are all birds. Yeah. Even the the five golden rings. Yeah. Goldfinches. Yep. A bird. Really? More birds. Oh yep. for God's sake! I don't need that. <laughs> have you ever seen? Have you heard Norm Macdonald's version of the Twelve Days of Christmas on his on his album? No, I should. It's very good, and it's just she keeps on giving him things, and he keeps on saying, "I just want a hat." <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate the My- hens laying, but I just really wanted the hat. My grandfather, uh, when he was still alive, used to every Christmas do a reading from the Reader's Digest at the Legion, and it was the wait what? Yeah, he used to read from the Reader's Digest at the Legion. Yeah, it was this this funny article that someone had, had written, and Grandpa liked it so much he got up one year at the Legion and read it, and it killed. And they asked him back just about every year to do it, and uh, it was the woman receiving the gifts, writing the letter to her to her mum. Being like, well, you're not going to believe what the idiot did today, <laughs> you know. And then each day, just going through the presents, and she's just, the woman's getting more and more exasperated. Like, well, the moron showed up, ate maids of milking. What what am I supposed to do with this? <laughs> <laughs> I don't have enough beds. I don't know what to do with them all. I, but I, I'm happy you brought up your grandfather because I wanted to close off like this. It feels like, and I know this is maybe a bit CBC of me, but it feels like, in addition to this being a really kind of funny record. It feels like it's something meaningful to you too to be able to tell this part of your family's history. It was uh, it was really nice to be able to include that and like I, I sort of tossed back and forth as to whether or not because the stories aren't necessarily all Christmassy about uh, my grandfather, but uh, I talked I started talking about my dad and then to really explain my dad I have to explain his parents and uh, you know Bill and Marjorie Wilson were quite the pair. And, uh, you know, we used to spend a, a lot of holidays and actually most March breaks when I was a kid, I'd get sent off to London, Ontario to hang out with, with Bill and Marjorie. And, um, they had these, these ridiculous stories that had come up over the years. And, uh, I, I started realizing even recently that some of my cousins hadn't even heard these stories yet. Like... I, I, these, these were stories we told in our house for ages and I, I'd started, you know, sharing them in other family functions and my cousins didn't even know about them. And there's a whole other generation of Wilsons that uh, never got to meet uh, my grandparents and, and wouldn't know all their things. And they were really interesting people. Uh, you know, grandpa, uh, once said he had all the talents of a wasted youth. He, uh, he was a crackerjack cards player and uh, he could clear a board of billiards and he didn't even have two eyes. Uh, and grandma was a vaudevillian. She toured, uh, with her identical twin back when they were what? kids. Really? And we're a song and dance team out of, uh, Moose Jaw, uh, Saskatchewan. They toured the U S and toured They Canada? did like Alaskan showboat cruises. They had their own dance studio in, uh, Vancouver until, uh, the, the great depression canceled dance lessons, but they started, they learned how to tap dance by correspondence in Moose Jaw, Saskatchewan. What? Yep, they used to get the the dance moves on big sheets of paper mailed to them from a school in New York, and they'd lay it out on the floor, and it would have all the routines mapped out by step, and that's how they they learned how to dance. That's so cool. Yeah, when I when I started acting, my grandma was real excited. I was getting into the family business. I was gonna say, I mean, you know, this is this is in some ways the family business for you. Yeah, no, she uh, she always talked about. Uh, I mean, when my grandma was ninety and could still do the routines, a little bit slower, a little bit wobbly, but she still had them all committed to memory. And so I, I really wanted to, it was really fun to to tell some of their stories, especially I mean the fact that my grandmother signed my grandfather up for World War II by accident. That's a, <laughs> a piece of family history the family really needs to remember. Grandpa was a veteran, but it wasn't his choice. No, it wasn't <laughs> it was grandma. <laughs> uh, thanks for coming in. Things going well. Thanks for having me. Things going well in Letter Kenny? Things have been great on Letter Kenny. Uh, we just wrapped uh, I guess Jeez, it's going to be season nine or something. Season right. eight's getting ready to come out on Christmas Day. And we're still under contract for two more seasons. So I think that thing's going to go 
for like 50 years. I'm hoping. I want to be, I want to like outlast the beachcombers and stuff I, like that. I think I, you are, man. <laughs> I think I read Jared, Jared Kiso, who's the, uh, what's a co-creator? Uh, He's uh, I mean, yeah, the creator, co, co-producer, co co-head writer, star. Of, of, of Letter Vivant of Letter Kenny. I saw his, I, I was, uh, I don't know if I was talking to him, I read an interview and he, they said, what are your goals for Letter Kenny? He said, I just want to be on the air forever. I just want to be on television. Yeah. Kiso and I have, have sat over, over drinks many a night, and he's told me he'd be quite happy doing this for the rest of his life, just writing Letter Kenny and performing Letter Kenny. And I was like, "Well, I'll be there as long as you'll have me, bud." And it's still fun. It's a blast. There, we call it summer camp. You know, we even when we do it in November, it's the. I mean, the first few years we were all sequestered together in a hotel room on a shoestring budget. Like, I, we were thinking back this season, first season, we didn't even have dressing rooms we all changed on the wardrobe trailer and we just all hung out all the time with each other because there was really sorry Sudbury not much to do right and um yeah there's some of my favorite people you know and now we do the the live tours and uh you know we we all live in a a bus and it's if you can spend two months in a bus with people and still like them they they got to be pretty decent folk and uh, yeah, no, we have a bl- and the, even the crew. A lot of the crew has been there since the very beginning. Um, my my fiance and I were witnesses at the wedding of our cameraman and his wife. Like we're uh, we're a tight knit group. There are there are Letter Kenny family, and uh, it's, uh, it's it's loved all over the world. I mean, it, it, I think that's what helps make a good show, though. Like yeah, there's, just the the, the there's the a real chemistry there. We're right. not we're not faking it. You know, no. Those, uh, we we get out there and it's uh, it's crazy how natural it is. Like we we show up on the first day and we'll sit down with the scripts and we'll just start running it in the makeup trailer and it's it's clockwork. It's like ingrained in our DNA now. We just fall back into the characters. We when we get to the farm, the they know how to set up and shoot the shots. Like it's I mean, we crack out 13 pages in a day, and it's it's because it's chemistry. Do you get people talking to you about it? Do people come up to you at the airport or somewhere trying to get you to quote stuff to them? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the weirdest one, actually, uh, I got chased down on Main Street USA in Disneyland this past <laughs> year. Uh, my my fiance and I were out uh, in L.A. for some business, and she hadn't been to, to Disneyland yet. So I was like, well, let's go. I'll show you what it's all about. And a couple chased us down on Main Street USA, and they're like, this may sound like a really weird question, but are you Squirrely Dan? And I was like, you know what? That's only a weird question if you're not Squirrely Dan. I actually get that every day. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> but uh, I'm, I'm amazed uh, how far it's gone and, and how many people really have have taken to it. Uh, I was in, I did Texas three times this past year. Tons of Letterkenny fans down there. Uh, actually, a while back, Nate and I did a show for 5,000 Allied troops, and we met Australian soldiers who were fans of the show, British soldiers who were fans of the show. They'd all discover it tape trading with uh, with Canadian soldiers because I guess Letterkenny was included in their homesickness package. They'd right. get sent episodes when they were serving overseas, and uh, they'd start trading with the other guys after they'd watched all of them. And so we had these Aussie soldiers who were, you know, who absolutely loved us and told us that. They'd listen. They'd watch the show on their way out to battle. Oh my god! <laughs> and they were thanking us for making the show. It's like, well, no, thank you for what you do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just, I'm sitting in a trailer in Sudbury, yeah. eating chicken on a bun. <laughs> okay, Trevor, thanks for coming in. Oh, thanks for having me, Tom. This okay. was a great time. I promise I'll be, I'll be here again when you come back. Yeah, I'll hold you to that. Yeah, okay. <laughs> you know what? I hope anyway. <laughs>